All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start with this. And uh, so hopefully you can see this. Um, one thing I'd like to start out with is uh, on the Florida Environmental Health Association's website, uh, there is, since this is an RS study uh, series of webinars, there are some uh, resources at the bottom of the continuing education webpage, which is the uh, second item at the top right here. Uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that there are some PowerPoint presentations uh, on various subjects. Um, the one that I'm going to say is complementary to this one is the one that says air quality and noise number two uh, in the bottom uh, right here. So this is a presentation I created a long, long time ago, and it was modified, I think, by Tracy Wade, and uh, it talks about uh, general air quality and noise control. And I, I would highly recommend looking at that to supplement this particular radiation. I mean, this particular presentation, which is focusing on um, indoor air quality and radon specifically. Uh, so anyway, we're part of the Florida Department of Health and uh, in the environmental health section, and we have a whole radon and indoor air quality web page that you're welcome to take a look at when you get a chance. And let's see if I get my presentations going. Let me switch displays. All right, hopefully you see my first slide. Uh, hopefully, is that everybody got that slide? Okay. So, thank you for coming and to the Florida Environmental Health webinar. And my name is Tim Wallace with the Florida Department of Health. Uh, this is, um, I'm with the Radon and Indoor Air Program, and um, we're in the public health toxicology section in the Bureau of Environmental Health in the Division of Disease Control and Health Protection. And I've been with the department for 30 years uh, in environmental health. I, I did have a small short stint with the Department of Law Enforcement in a lab, but uh, most of this time has been with the Department of Health, or HRS as it used to be called. Um, so this picture on the left is our uh, radon, one of our radon poster contest winners. Uh, we have some really good artists in Florida, and we were students, and we asked them to uh, join with us to discuss radon and and provide and, and compete in a in a Florida radon poster contest. And here's another winner uh, from previous years. Uh, these are very talented uh, kids and. Uh, every year, we, we, it starts at September 1st and closes on November 1st, so this is a head start. If you know, if you have students that are in this age range or if you know teachers, uh, please share this with them uh, and, and get them interested in and perhaps participating. Uh, so one of the things that we're required to do under Florida statutes is provide outreach and education and awareness, and so this radon poster contest is one of them. This is this year's winner. Uh, 2021. Uh, this has been sent on uh, the top three or four winners in Florida are sent on to the national right on poster con. We've had quite a few winners from Florida uh, win the nationals. So they, they get recognition and their, their, their posters are often used to promote uh, indoor air quality awareness uh, and radon awareness uh, throughout national radon action months, which is January. Um, we also deal with training and certification of professionals to do radon testing and measurement. And also we uh, conduct, uh, we actually coordinate mandatory radon measurement in Florida. Uh, so anyway, this is a link to our, um, so someone had to dial in to get audio. I apologize for that, but that might be an option for you all. Um, so if anyone's interested in the podcast, just come to our website and you can find out more about it. We also provide uh, archives of previous winners, so you can kind of marvel at the art artistry of our children in Florida. And uh, it's pretty neat, uh, very creative uh, artists. Okay, Rick is saying he still can't not hear. Um, okay. So again, Nat, uh, 
January is National Radar in Action Month, and this is uh, our effort uh, once a year uh, through the month of January to increase people's awareness and ask them to test their homes for radon and fix those radon levels if they are high. And we're going to kind of focus on that uh, throughout this presentation. We're going to talk about what is radiation, what is radon, why do we care about it, what are the health impacts, uh, how does it get into buildings, what are the regulations in Florida, what can you do about it? Testing, mitigation, and radon resistant new construction are the focus here. And then we're going to talk a little bit about carbon monoxide, lead-based paint hazards, uh, dampness and mold, and then uh, we're going to talk about air cleaners and other devices that might be helpful to improve indoor air quality in buildings and reduce risks. Uh, what is radon? It's an element. It's a radioactive gas. It's naturally occurring. It's odorless, colorless, and tasteless, tasteless so you cannot detect its presence, but it's a naturally occurring. It comes from the decayed uranium, which is found naturally in the soil and rock below us. Um, Sometimes we get radon from earthen materials that are used in the construction of buildings, like concrete and granite, for example. And it's even found in uh, well water uh, that we bring into our homes. This radon can concentrate inside the houses and, and buildings, and uh, it, it is our largest source of everyday radiation exposure. So this chart uh, kind of is a pie chart. Uh, looking at both natural and artificial radiation exposure over a period of a year. This is your annual dosage. So if you were exposed to uh, radon at four picocuries per liter of air, uh, which is the recommended action level from the Environmental Protection Agency, this is how we measure it in picocuries. That's basically the disintegrations of radon in a liter of air. Um, one picocuries is like for, I'm going to say four million. I may not have that number right. But anyway, there's a lot of disintegrations of radon occurring in that liter of air, and um, that, that's a problem. And when we look at this pie chart, we're looking at on an av annual average at four picocuries, you've got about 63% of your annual dose is radiation in your lungs, which is bad. Uh, the other forms of uh, natural radiation exposure are cosmic from outer space, internal from the food you eat and your bones, and terrestrial from the earth below us. Um, there's also artificial uh, radiation exposures like CAT scans, nuclear medicine, x-rays, fluoroscopy, and consumer products. But the radon itself kind of dwarfs all of these and in terms of what, do you are, what are you radiated by? We could, if we adopt radon-resistant uh, construction policies, we could reduce our annual radiation dose by at least 25%. So why do we care about radon? We're concerned about radon because it's the leading cause of lung cancer for non-smokers. Um, it accounts for about 21,000 lung cancer deaths per year, which is much higher uh, than a lot of other causes of death, like drunk driving and drowning, secondhand smoke, home fires, and even asbestos. Um, it's estimated that radon-related lung cancer mortality or deaths uh, comes to a cost of about $6.8 billion a year to our economy. And this also doesn't account for the cost of trying to save someone's life if they've been diagnosed with lung cancer, which has a very high mortality rate in, a, in a relation to other types of cancers. Uh, so the radon burden in Florida is pretty high for lung cancer. It's among the highest of all types of cancers. Um, and of that, let's say, in, in the cancer burden in Florida in 2016, of those 16 or 17,000 people with uh, lung or bronchus cancers, about 14% of those are radon related. So that's about uh, 2,500 or so. Radon health effects. Radon, uh, radon is, is in a chain of radioactive decay. So it's not just uranium, radium, radon. It, it continues on with other decay products like uh, polonium, for example. 
and both radon and the radon decay products, some of them release, and a lot of them release, alpha particles, which is a type of radiation. Basically, the nucleus of radon is releasing uh, two protons and two neutrons as an atomic bullet as it's disintegrating. That That is an alpha particle, and it's very powerful. Um, well, I will say this. It's not powerful outside of our body because alpha radiation can be stopped by our skin. So alpha radiation sources are not an issue outside the body. But we breathe the radon in, and we also breathe in the radon decay products into our lungs, and we have no skin inside our lungs to protect from the alpha radiation, which is the dangerous stuff when it's inside your body. Uh, these alpha particles in your lungs can actually damage the DNA in the nucleus of your cells, of your lungs. And it's not every uh, disintegration hits the DNA. It's, it's a chance. It's an opportunity, um, you know, one in a thousand, one in a hundred, one in a ten thousand chance that that damage occurs. If that damage occurs, in some cases, the DNA is repairing itself and the cell goes on as usual. Uh, or it, it damages in such a way that the cell can uh, no longer function and it dies. And that's not a horrible outcome either because we do replace our cells uh, all the time. And that's, uh, it, you know, that the body goes on. Uh, on the other hand, if the DNA uh, is improperly repaired, uh, there is a chance that that improper repair or re transcription of putting back those uh, DNA bonds to back together, that it puts it back together in such a way that turns on or tells the cell to reproduce and divide. And that's basically what potential cancer, that's basically what leads to this uh, cancer in the lungs is these cells, uh, the damage to the DNA causes the mutation. And uh, one way of looking at this is, uh, Basically, if you buy one ticket to the uh, lottery, the Powerball or whatever it's called, uh, your chances of getting of winning are very slim. Well, let's say you buy a hundred tickets, are your chances a little bit better? A little bit, but not much. Let's say you buy a um, uh, thousand tickets, are you, your chances increasing? Absolutely. Well, but you know, still it's kind of small, but let's say there's tens of thousands of tickets that you actually buy. Well, this is kind of equivalent to alpha radiation, is the more radon that you're exposed to, the more alpha radiation you're exposed to, the more tickets you're buying to the lung cancer lottery. And this is a, a lottery that you're not, you don't want to win, so you want to buy less tickets. You want to reduce your exposure to radon. So that's kind of how this goes. Now, we're talking about radon. We're talking about long-term exposures over a lifetime, 10, 15, 20 years, for example. A short-term exposure is not as important as the long-term exposures. Um, so that's just something to think about. How does radon get into homes and buildings? Well, basically, it gets them through cracks, plumbing, electrical penetrations and construction joints in homes. It can come in through well water as well. Uh, it, it can also um, become trapped and concentrated in the homes because essentially buildings kind of, they stuck. Uh, uh, homes suck and uh, there is a kind of a, a weak pressure or a suction field on the ground for houses because war, warm elder air develops in the home, it rises to the higher levels of the home, and then there's cooler air underneath that replaces that air. This is called the stack effect. And it's it's kind of a weak effect, but it does provide some suction on the ground. And we accentuate that or add to that suction by turning on uh, devices, like mechanical devices, like the exhaust from a stove. Uh, or the bathroom exhaust after you've taken a shower, or if you have gas water heaters, there's a constant airflow going up that stack, and that provides an additional level of suction. Or even if you turn on um, the the uh, clothes dryer, that, that is a big exhaust fan in the house, and that provides additional suction on the ground. Now, the uh, radon from water is not as big of an issue. 
uh, as uh, the air itself. It takes about a thousand picocuries per liter in the water to equivalent to one picocuries of radon in the air. So in Florida, we haven't seen as big an issue from the water as some other states north of us, uh, let's say like Pennsylvania, for example, or even Georgia. Um, so, but we always recommend that you test for radon in the air. Uh, you can test from the water if you want to, but it's usually less of a contributor than the air is. Oh, and that last bullet is sometimes the radon can come from building materials. If if the building materials contain radium, you know, sand and rock and and aggregate, those materials can have radium in them, and they will go through the radioactive decay chain and actually introduce radon just through diffusion out of the building materials, like granite and concrete, for example. So according to our data in Florida, we have a database from uh, several sources, but one of them is the certified radon businesses that, are, that when they provide radon testing, they, they are required to provide that data to us. And according to that data, one out of every five homes in Florida has a level at or above the action level of four picocuries per liter of air. Um, and in some cases, that's even higher than that. And we have probably more of a problem that it's than there was before. For example, Marion and Alachua County both have one out of three, which is 33%, which is quite high. And some areas in those counties, some subset locations, are about 50%, which is really high. So we, we do need to test for radon in homes. There's a high probability of it in comparison to the rest of the nation um, on average. Now, the out now let's compare this with outdoor data. Uh, outdoor data radon is normally in the air about 0.4 picocuries per liter. And the average home across the United States averaged out is about 1.3, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, and in Florida, w w it, it comes from the soil, right? But we've also found radon in high, uh, in high rise condominiums of, even the, the 23rd floor of that condominium. It, through investigation, it was determined it wasn't the soil that was 23 floors down, it was actually the building materials that were used in the construction, the concrete. It was the source of the radon. And as far as the highest levels go, the highest levels recorded in a, an occupiable building so far have been around 307 in a house in, in Tallahassee. Uh, we have uh, we have been uh, we have received reports of radiation uh, radon levels around 500 in an unoccupied storm shelter in Gainesville, uh, but that that doesn't it's not occupied, so we're not going to count it as the top record for occupiable building. Uh, we do provide the radon test data from uh, these businesses to the environmental public health tracking program at the Department of Health, which also shares that with the Centers for Disease Control. And they both provide uh, some geographical representation of uh, radon data. So if you're looking at this map, the red counties, uh, this is pre-mitigation testing. Um, you know, they were at or above four picocuries per liter, so that's a majority of the counties. Uh, the orange ones are from two to four, and this is for a particular year, 2018. And uh, the the ones that are yellow uh, were from zero to two. Uh, but you want you may want to notice there's a lot of gray counties. Those are no test no test results whatsoever. Uh, we have no data in those counties. If they tested, we'd probably find out that they'd be yellow or red or orange. Um, and then the ones that are hashed are the ones with very little data, less than 10 results. So the less data you have, the more sure you are of what you are looking at. So we want people to understand that radon is, is everywhere throughout the state, whether people are testing for it or not. 
We do have some regulations, as I mentioned earlier. We certify the radon measurement and mitigation businesses. We, there is a re mandatory requirement for radon testing, and they are required to provide that radon testing data to the Florida Department of Health for schools, daycare centers, assisted living facilities, jails, et cetera. And we've been reminding the schools and the child care centers that they need to provide this testing data to us. If we don't have it, then they're not in compliance. And we, we just sent out a, an email to about 6,000 child care centers throughout the state to remind them of this requirement. And of course, that, that kind of blew up the phones for a while, and I think they're still calling in today. Um, there's also a requirement for disclosure in real estate transactions, uh, and that's and this is, and if you work for a health department, hear about this uh, from people who've saw it in their, either their rental contract or the sales contract somewhere. This statement: with radon is a naturally occurring radioactive gas that, when accumulating in building in sufficient quantities, may present health risks to persons who are exposed to it over time, and that levels of radon that ex exceed federal or state guidelines have been found in buildings in Florida. And if you need additional information, please contact your county health department. That's the mandatory requirement in the Florida statutes for this, this very specific language. So what can you do about it? Well, we, the Florida Department of Health, the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, American Lung Association, American Cancer Society, uh, citizens for radioactive radon reduction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We are all recommending that people test their homes for radon and find out what the levels are. And it's fairly easy to do. It's fairly affordable to do. And I'll mention how affordable it is in a minute. Uh, there are do-it-yourself radon test kits, and you can also hire one of our certified professionals that are certified through the Department of Health. We provide a, a link to all the ones that are approved and certified uh, or are certified in the state of Florida on our webpage, which is radon.floridahealth.gov. Uh, now, once you find out what the levels are, then you can decide whether you, you need or should mitigate or fix the radon levels. Mitigate is just another word for lowering. You want to look at those levels in the home to reduce your risks. So test options are basically primarily long-term or short-term. Short-term test kits, we're not talking about radon. We're talking about days, weeks, and months. Two to 90 days is a short-term test kit. Most of them are usually two to three days. Uh, Long-term testing is going to be more accurate uh, and more accurate in determining your actual real health risks, and those are three months to a year. Uh, but for short-term testing, that's kind of screening. That's the potential you're trying to figure out, do you have a problem or not, and uh, that's the way you go. And there are different types of test kits and technologies out there. These are just pictures and examples. But it really is the only way to determine uh, what your levels are. Now, this is uh, something that we started a couple of years ago. We're providing uh, no charge, no cost radon test kits, and some of our county health departments are also offering this as well. If, if you're a youngster and you got the, one of those smartphones, you can, uh, I'm showing my age here, you can scan this uh, QR code into your phone and it'll take you to our website and to our radon test kit coupon, which looks like this. It's on our webpage. And, and we have to remind people that this is a matter of public record. If they make this request, uh, we will have that information, and it's uh, available to anyone who asks for that information. So they acknowledge that. And then we uh, ask for their contact information and their you know, location, and we also need their email address because that's how the results are communicated to them from the laboratory that provides the analysis. We have a short quiz uh, or survey kind of asking, is this a follow-up? What's your age group? Had you tested previously for radon at this address or another address? And, you know, where did you hear about it? Did you hear about it from the health department? Did you hear about social media? We do actually have a Facebook campaign going on right now in the month of January, and we have some uh, uh, news station, uh, some public service announcements going on in public radio here in Tallahassee. So we are making a lot of efforts to uh, spread the word, and hopefully you've heard about it yourself as well. 
Um, we do ask that they put in a confirmation number so they're not uh, we're not robots uh, asking for this, and that they acknowledge that these test kits are not to be used for mandatory testing requirements for daycare centers, schools, et cetera. So about the test kits, what are the results? How do you interpret those results? We have an algorithm that helps people make decisions based on the results that they get. If it's less than two picocuries per liter, then we're suggesting no further action uh, for five years, unless you make st structural changes to the building, uh, go ahead and test again after five years and see if the levels have changed. Because radon levels do not always remain the same. They do vary from one day to the next, one hour to the next, one season to the next, and from one year to the next. So that's why we want to kind of follow up after five years to see if there's anything that has changed in your building that might uh, increase the amount. If it's between two and four, then you may want to, uh, or between four and eight, you want to go with a long-term follow-up test kit just to get a better idea of the actual true risk because you're kind of, you're two above and, and four up you're four above and two under, and you kind of want to double check to make sure. And you can do a time-weighted average, and if you're between two and four, consider mitigation. If you're above four and you're time-weighted average, then mitigation is recommended. And if you're testing at eight on your initial, do, do a short-term test kit. Don't worry about long-term. Do another short-term just to make sure and verify that that eight is accurate. Uh, in, in the right ballpark and then go ahead and consider mitigation because levels of eight and higher are significant radiation dose to you. We do have a calculator on our website that you can use to help with the time-weighted average calculations if, if necessary. So how can you fix this? Well, we call this mitigation and the most common tool used or technology used is active soil depressurization, sometimes called sub-slab suction. And uh, I'll talk about this more. I'll show some pictures about it. Uh, also, mechanical ventilation is also used in some buildings where uh, active soil depressurization is not, uh, is not, uh, is cannot be done, in other words. If you can't do it, then, the, then you go to a mechanical ventilation. But in, in, in most cases, you're going to be sealing cracks and plumbing and electrical penetrations in the building so that when you put in a subsoil sub depressurization system, uh, you can control where the radon is coming from. You can't control it if you have a lot of entryways for the radon to come in. So uh, if you're going to put in a mitigation system, it's, it, uh, typically if you're a slab on grade, you're going to cut a hole in uh, a closet, for example, and various places in the home. You may need more than one suction point. You basically dig this hole out, grab uh, a, with a hand shovel, dig it out, put some rock in there in place of the soil you dug out, and then you install a, a PVC pipe and seal that pipe to that hole, and you plumb that pipe uh, all the way to the roof and, and above the roof. And in some cases, you may have to plumb this to the outside of the house and then above the roof line. That big bulge that you see, uh, I don't know if my pointer works here, that bulge is a fan, and that's a fan. This is providing the suction. So it's suck, sucking the radon from underneath the foundation and trying to get it, trying to prevent it from coming into the house, and thus reducing the levels. Now, if you're a, not a slab on grade and if it's on a crawl space, these houses can also have radon problems as well because the radon travels up through the floor or other penetrations. So you can seal the ground underneath the crawl space, uh, and then you can put a suction system underneath that seal and, uh, and thus reduce, reduce the amount of radon coming in to the house with the occupied space. And that exhaust system would look like the previous picture. You know, you, you send it out above the roof. Uh, for buildings that can't really do this uh, for whatever practical reason, then they do usually go with a ventilation style where they introduce air from the outside mechanically and then they, they try to dilute the amount of radon in the air. This is actually more expensive in most cases because it has to be engineered. It needs, uh, they need to control for relative humidity and dampness from the outside because outside the air is hot and humid most of the year. 
And uh, so there, there, there's, this is a, a viable strategy, but it, it can be expensive. But we do recommend that there, it's cheaper than putting in a mitigation system is to actually build it into your home when you build it or other building. And this is, can be done through the radon resistant new construction standards that are in the appendix of the Florida Building Code. Uh, this standard kind of reduces, basically has a, a standard for reducing radon entry through the foundation, limiting and sealing intentional plumbing or electrical penetrations, and also doing the same for crawl spaces. This is not a mandate. Uh, it, it can only be mandated if a county government works with the cities and decides that this is what they want to do and adopt it on a local basis. And we are actively encouraging local governments to consider doing this um, as part of one of our um, one of our goals for the state indoor radon grant that we get from the EPA. Um, now, what does radon-resistant new construction look like? It looks just like a mitigation system, only it's planned and built into the system, where you have a gas permeable layer underneath the foundation, which is rock, or it may be a drainage mat, something that allows the gas to accumulate in a space. And then over that, you have plastic sheeting that is sealed around all penetrations. And also, uh, you caulk and you, you make sure that the joints are also sealed. And then uh, it's better, uh, we think it's best to add a vent pipe into that uh, gas permeable layer. You run that through the roof and you allow that radon to escape from the house and rather than coming into it. And E is a junction box. This is for electrical in case you need to add a fan to it to add that additional suction to that uh, ground underneath the foundation. And uh, our current radi uh, radi uh, radon resistant new construction doesn't include the vent pipe or the junction box, but that is recommended and is in international and national standards. Um, we do also recommend that if you build it into a home that you test the home after it's uh, completed to verify that the system is working or whether or not you need to add the fan to it. Um, and that's actually made it into the, nas the, the national building code just recently. Um, radon gas is the second leading ca uh, cause of what? Lung cancer? Yes, that's the answer. Uh, High radon levels have been found in just a few areas of Florida, or, or no, all, all areas of Florida. And testing is really the only way to determine if you have a level, and we want everyone to do that. Now, I'm going to switch gears here from radon to another indoor air pollutant, which is also important and has caused deaths and injuries uh, and the disease. It's a poisoning uh, from carbon monoxide, which is a carbon and oxygen together in a molecule. This, is, this comes from burning uh, fuel, uh, wood, uh, gasoline, kerosene. Anything that burns can produce carbon monoxide as a part of that uh, flame chemistry equation. Um, on average, we have about uh, 450 or less than 450 deaths a year attributed to carbon monoxide poisoning from non-fire, unintentional related deaths. Now compare that to 21,000 lung cancer deaths attributed to radon exposure, and you can kind of see that uh, the carbon monoxide in terms of death is much lower than that. Uh, on Florida, our average is about 25. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning deaths a year, but we have a much higher number in the several thousands of actual poisonings, and these poisonings tend to cluster around hurricanes when there's use of portable generators or people uh, running cars or generators in their garages, um, doing different various things that with devices that produce, or even bring in uh, cooking devices that are they're designed for outdoor use, like charcoal grills or gas grills, bringing them inside because of the weather, they don't have power, They're, they can poison themselves with carbon monoxide. So what we're recommending in this, uh, I just want to show you that little graphic at the bottom, that's a red blood cell. Carbon monoxide will bind to that red blood cell and prevent oxygen 
from being carried by that red blood cell to the rest of your body. And you are basically being starved of oxygen. That is a toxico that's the toxicology of it. Um, it's a chemical asphyxiant is what it is. And so what what is the one thing I recommend well, the one bottom line thing is we should all have uh, carbon monoxide alarms in every house in the United States and in Florida. At least one per bedroom cluster is our recommendation from the National Fire Protection Association, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and, and others uh, that uh, care about this kind of stuff. So that is my recommendation. I recommend that people give these out as gifts to the people they care the most about. A matter of fact, I, I, uh, my family just bought a carbon monoxide alarm for my neighbor yesterday. So uh, it, it's something you should give to your loved ones. And also, I think about it at Christmas time uh, or, or Hanukkah or, or whatever. If you have Christmas stockings, you know, throw one of these carbon monoxide alarms in a uh, a family member, and just uh, think of the look on their face when they open it up and, oh, a carbon monoxide alarm. Yay, that's what I always wanted. So you can have some satisfaction there, hopefully, uh, and a smile on their face and your face. Um, the gift of life, right? So uh, don't use portable generators indoors. They, they, they typically generate an enormous amount of carbon monoxide when they're in use. Um, so there, this is this is what kills a lot of people is they they give them too close to their homes or they have them inside their homes, and you think this is intuitive, but a lot of people are doing it, and it's kind of uh, when you're talking about uh, main source of carbon monoxide, it is the engine-driven tools that are are the majority of these poisonings and deaths. So this this graphic on the right is a required mandatory pictogram that should be on portable generators, no matter in the manual, on the device itself. Never use it inside or in a garage, even if the doors or windows are open. Using it indoors can kill you in minutes. Uh, it, you can't see it, you can't smell it, and uh, you know, get it away from your home. Now, the recommendation away from your home is at least 20 feet. That's been the current recommendation for the past two or uh, about past five years or so. And uh, you know, is that a safe level? Not necessarily that we have people that have been poisoned even within that 20 feet, but you're more likely to survive if it's beyond 20 feet. That's that's the current basis for that. I'm going to switch now to lead-based paint. Lead is a poison. Uh, it's a metal. It's a it's a found in the Earth's crust, and we mine this out and have been using it industrially for years and years and years and years and years and years and centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's been poisoning us ever since. It's a legacy poison. And one of the things that we've been using it for um, was, you know, we use it for gasoline, like leaded gasoline. And uh, that's been banned, so now you can't get leaded gasoline, which is good. Because that, that was an enormous amount of exposure for a lot of people. But another major source for exposure has been lead-based paint. That was used to, uh, to increase the durability and uh, the color selection of, of paints and durability. So they used this quite heavily up until it was banned by federal law in 1978. So homes that are, that are built prior to 1978 likely have uh, lead-based paint in them. And there's a law that requires residential disclosure uh, for home buyers and renters. And this is required before contract obligation or lease signature. Now, who is at most at risk from lead-based paint? It's children. They're more affected by the lead, and it affects them for the rest of their lives. There's no safe level of lead for children or adults. Um, so we need to, you know, people need to be aware of that. And, that's, and part of this course is based on our, our home buyer's education course, and this is why we're delving into disclosure issues. Um, the, the sellers and, uh, and landlords are required to provide this pamphlet from the EPA, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and HUD to you know, educate them on what lead can do and how to protect their family from it. And the sellers and or landlords are required to disclose any known, late, or any known information about the presence of lead and provide that in this uh, disclosure compliance statement. Now, the, the tenant and or buyer waive uh, their right to hire 
a EPA certified lead-based paint risk assessor or certified um, lead-based paint uh, uh, inspector to inspect the home prior to the sale or, or a lease agreement. They can, they can, if they don't want to do that, if they don't want to be bothered with that, they can just sign that compl uh, disclosure compliance statement and buy or rent as is, but they've been informed and educated that's, that's the legal requirement. I'm going to switch a little bit to asbestos, which is a mineral fiber, also mined from the ground, but it has very special properties and where it's, a, it's basically a microscopic needle. And it can, we have found over the years that it can be inhaled into the lungs. And then when it is inhaled into the lungs, it can cause lung disease and other diseases. And these diseases are quite serious. Lung cancer is one of them. Asbestosis, which is uh, basically scarring of the lung due to the inhalation of these fibers, and also another type of cancer called mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the mesothelium, which is the lining around the lungs, where some of these fibers can actually make their way out of the lungs into that lining and then cause cancer there. So it, it's also a known carcinogen, just like radon. Um, but it's been used in building material because of its retardant properties or its insulation properties. And it's generally only a threat when it's disturbed by uh, demolition, renovation, you know, something that makes those fibers aerosolized, friable is the word they use in the industry. Um, where is it commonly found? Well, like in wrapping uh, around hot water pipes, um, uh, wood-burning stoves, um, vinyl tile and vinyl flooring backings. Uh, it's been found in, in joint compounds for drywall. It's been found in vermiculite insulation, which is a type of insulation that's pictured in the right. This has been used in attics as an insulation product. The, 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 the asbestos is a contaminant in that insulation and has been installed in homes around the United States. If you believe that a material might have asbestos in it, try not to disturb it, uh, but do. We do recommend that you consider hiring a, a state licensed asbestos business to test the material before renovations or demolitions or if you're going to disturb it or remove it. They can determine whether it has asbestos or not. And the state agency that does the licensing is the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. There are also federal and state laws regarding demolition and renovation in certain types of buildings. Uh, and uh, the Department of Environmental Protection here in Florida is responsible for enforcing that in most of the counties. There are some counties that have their own uh, air pollution control programs. Um, and there's even, even a county health department that has an air pollution control program that's authorized, and that's Palm Beach County. Uh, Florida Department of Health in Palm Beach County. They're very unique in that situation. Uh, we appreciate their activities in that matter. Now I'm going to switch again to dampness and mold. And this is what takes up most of my time uh, almost every day is people with questions about this. They want to know, is mold healthy or not? What can I do about it? How can I control it? Uh, why is it happening? And basically, the key message I offer people is that mold is a moisture problem. If you want to identify and correct this mold problem, you're going to have to identify and correct the moisture problem. Mold can't grow without water or dampness. Um, moisture is not only a mold issue, it's also something that can attract pests and degrade building materials. And those building materials may contain asbestos, may lead to the release of asbestos fibers, or it may deteriorate lead-based paint, which can lead to exposure to lead. Um, so moisture and also formaldehyde, uh, it can help uh, accelerate the release of formaldehyde from engineered wood products like uh, particle board or plywood or orient strand board, for example. And then dust mites. Dust mites like damp conditions and they, they poop out enzymes. They live, they live in our dust. They're basically in all homes. And then they exude these uh, enzymes in their poop, which can trigger allergies and asthma uh, and cause asthma in people who don't already have it. So moisture is not just a mold problem. It's a, it, it leads to a lot of other issues. 
And, of course, moisture, we're talking about the most obvious one, like it's uh, my plumbing is leaking, I've had, just had a flood, or there's been a condensation or poor humidity problem, which is usually less uh, obvious to the people that are experiencing it. They don't understand why it's happening. So when it's less obvious and they're not having leaks, I explain to them that they can control relative humidity in their homes. And, uh, and to do that, they have to measure it. They need to measure the relative humidity with a device. This is called a hygrometer, or if you want to call it a relative humidity device, you know, whatever you want to call it. But it's, uh, it, it can measure relative humidity and tell you what the levels are, and it's in a 0 to 100% uh, setting. Now, this is a digital version. There's an older version with a needle pointing on a scale you know, from 0 to 100. That's also fine. That's perfectly acceptable technology, old school. Um, and then once you determine what your levels are, you want to see if you can achieve 50% or less. That's a recommendation of the Centers for Disease Control. It's also our recommendation as well. Uh, use dehumidifiers as needed. What is a dehumidifier? It's an electronic device used to control and lower relative humidity when you need it. It's not something you'll need all the time. If you use a relative humidity device, it'll tell you what your levels are and then uh, consider using a dehumidifier to, to control if necessary. Um, and, and I can talk about this, you know, this could be a whole new presentation. But some people ask about mold and what, what does it look like, and they, they're not sure if it's mold or not. And we've all seen mold. Uh, this is my supervisor's coffee cup after about a week. Uh, some mold has started eating the coffee that was left behind. And this is another famous picture of mold growing and colonizing the uh, ceiling of the home. All right. Um, and this is also, I didn't have to go far. This is mold growing in the refrigerator of our workplace, uh, in my office. Uh, people had left behind food and, uh, for long periods of time, and then so mold claimed it for itself. So this is... Uh, this is a, uh, someone said the slides were being delayed. Sorry to hear about that. Uh, but this is, uh, again, we've seen mold. We know what it looks like, and we should remove these materials from, from the building. Uh, there's, no, there's no reason to clean this red rice, red rice and beans or this chicken or pork chop or whatever it happens to be. There's no reason to clean these items. They're decayed. They're uncleanable. You throw them away. Some surfaces, however, can be cleaned if they're moldy. Now, here's a situation where you had a flood, and uh, if someone asks if you can have the slides, and yes, we can provide you with the slides. Um, this is a flood. Water wicked up those floors, or those walls. In, it kind of destroyed part of the flooring. It also went up this drywall, this gypsum board, and, um, and you can see that there's a heavy amount of mold growth here. This is very unhealthy, very, very, very unhealthy. Uh, this is not something you want to live in, uh, and you'd want to clean this up. Now, cleaning this up is going to basically be removal of that drywall. You might have to, t and you'll, you'll have to look inside and see if the conditions of the studs, uh, see if the studs have been uh, structurally compromised by rot, uh, because this is a long-term moisture problem, and this is a lot of water. Uh, if, the, if those structural components are compromised, then they'll need to be replaced, uh, hopefully by a contractor who's licensed to do so. Now, people that are removing this mold probably should be wearing uh, personal protective equipment, uh, respiratory protection, eye protection, and skin protection at minimum. And there are some people that shouldn't be involved in this whatsoever. It's, you have a, a compromised immune system. If you have uh, allergies to mold, if you're asthmatic, if you're a small child, if you're elderly, uh, if you have an autoimmune disease, if you're being treated for cancer, if you're taking drugs to suppress uh, your immune system, yes, uh, I understand they're delayed. I don't know that I can do anything about that. But this is a situation where you may want to reach out to someone else to remove the mold uh, in this home. Why are people calling me? All right. So we know what that looks like. We also know what mold looks like if uh, maybe it's a humidity control problem. 
And to the left here is a picture of uh, remote control that is being colonized by mold. On the right is a picture of uh, some furniture and belongings that are growing in mold in an office. So we, we kind of know what this looks like. It's not a mystery. Now, mold is not the only type of fungi that can colonize a building. There are other types of molds that produce uh, mushrooms. And uh, these mushrooms, think of them as fruits of a tree. These are the fruiting bodies of a, of a much uh, larger colony of mold, uh, fungi. And if you see mushrooms going in a building like this, this is very unhealthy. This is an indicator of a significant and long-term moisture problem in the building, and, and they may have some structural damage that they need to look into when they resolve this issue. All right, so we got some common questions, and I've answered a lot of these already, but we'll go over them real quick. Is indoor mold growth unhealthy? The answer is yes. Um, people should not be living in moldy buildings. The primary reasons are allergies, asthma, respiratory disease, and opportunistic infections. Um, so those are the reasons why. Should you have mold in your home tested? Our, our suggestion is from the EPA, Centers for Disease Control, and all the 50 state health departments is no, you really shouldn't be testing for mold in the air in particular because there's no standards for exposure-based uh, uh, risk assessment. We don't know what levels will trigger a health effect or not, and so inter interpreting air sampling results is um, not health-based, it's not science-based. Uh, however, there are some circumstances where this might be useful for surface sampling. Again, surface sampling might be useful, air sampling not particularly. Uh, when is professional assistance recommended? And these are usually for either uh, 10 square feet, like that one picture I showed earlier about the flooded home, that might be a reason for bringing in professional assistance. Or, uh, or if you are immunocompromised, or if you have allergies, if you can't, just can't do it yourself. Or let's say sentimental items. Let's say you have an oriental rug that's been in the family for generations and you want it's moldy and you want it restored and clean, you might want to bring in a professional cleaner for that. Um, or let's see, uh, what kind of professionals that are available to assist and you're going to be either uh, in Florida, there is a licensing requirement if they provide mold assessment or more mold remediation for hire. Who does that? Licensing, again, it's the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. And they do have a website where you can verify that someone has a license for mold assessment or mold remediation. Um, are there guidance for uh, assessment and remediation? And the answer is yes. The Centers for Disease Control has a very good website for practical information on how to remove and address mold. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency has had a long-standing web page dedicated to mold remediation and assessment for for several decades now. It's 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 there, and, and we at the health department are pointing to the CDC and the EPA uh, as far as more detailed guidance. There's also guidance from other organizations as well, from professional societies, if you're interested. Who regulates mold in Florida? And the answer to this question is. Well, maybe the locals do. There's no state laws that authorize mold regulation in Florida. Now, could we at the health department address a mold problem? And I, my answer to that is only in the places that we're allowed to do inspections and are authorized to do inspections. So, for example, assisted living facilities, um, uh, schools, um, uh, migrant labor camps. Places that we're authorized to do inspections of, yes, we can cite mold as an unclean, unsanitary condition and pass disrepair if we can see what's causing it. So, so in situations where we have uh, facilities that we inspect, we can certainly cite for uncleanliness and unsanitary conditions. Is mold reportable in Florida? Well, no, not really. Uh, like if you have a mold problem in a rental property, we are not authorized to regulate that situation. So, yes, you can call us, but we're we're not able to at the health department. But we can certainly offer information on on things that people can do to help with their situations, or at least help them understand 
what they can do as tenants, what they can do uh, to uh, mitigate or resolve or minimize their problems. We do, if you're interested in much uh, more in-depth webinar on the subject, we have a two-hour webinar that was uh, myself and uh, representatives from the Centers for Disease Control and the EPA. We did it two hours on mold hurricanes health in Florida, and this is available on Train Florida if you're a you know, uh, if you get into that, or you can go directly to the link. If you go to Train Floor, I believe it will offer you a credits. We also have this uh, webinar on the Florida Association of Code Enforcement, uh, you know, as a webinar that they can you can get to on their website, which is face-online.org, in their education the webinars. If you need this link later, you can email me, you can call me, uh, you can also probably Google it. I'm going to talk a little bit about air cleaners. This is kind of a, a newer subject that research has been telling us over the years that we do have problems with air pollution and air particulate pollution in particular, both indoors and outdoors. And the research is telling us that air cleaners that have high efficiency particulate arrestants or HEPA filters that are equipped there, in other words, they're filtering out particles to a very fine level, that can out actually help with health outcomes. Uh, so the, the, the evidence is growing on this, and what I want to impart upon you that room air cleaners are uh, a viable way to improve indoor air quality and reduce exposure to not only basic dust and particles, you know, smoke and, and viral and mold spores and pollen and cat and dog dander and all that stuff, but also even the radon decay products that act like particles, like polonium. It can help with reducing those, uh, you know, things out of the air so you're breathing in less of those radon decay products. So with air cleaners, you can look at this label this is from the Home Appliance Manufacturers, uh, Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. They call it the clean air delivery rate. And it's a label that they can put on this device where they rate its ability to reduce particles in the air, like tobacco smoke, dust, and pollen, as examples. The higher the numbers are, the better that device is at filtering those particles and delivering that clean air. And they do also give you a recommendation for the size of the room that you're going to use it in. Uh, so this has kind of gained more added importance in the age of COVID at this point. And so it is something that people can do to help improve and lower the amount of partic particulates they're inhaling. Uh, one additional thing here is for California Air Resources Board, CARB, they have a regulation for air cleaners and, and that they prevent them, if they comply with their re regulatory requirement, to not exceed federal ozone emission limits. So this is an additional recommendation. If you're going to buy an air cleaner, make sure it has the California Air Resources Board certification that it does not produce uh, unhealthy amount of ozone. Ozone is very unhealthy in indoor environments and outdoor environments. Don't introduce ozone into your home or business. Uh, and that goes for all situations. Uh, I don't care how many people ask me about adding ozone into the home or building, don't do it. All right, safe. And I'm going to, this is my, I'm going to finish up here by saying test your home for radon, fix your home for radon if the levels are high, control dampness, monitor for relative humidity, remove mold whenever it's found, dry things out, install carbon monoxide alarms in all homes. Every home should have one or at least one. And be aware of legacy hazards if your homes are older. And if you, know, if you need to bring in licensed or certified contractors to look at lead-based paint or asbestos, that may be a good idea to do. Uh, consider using uh, air cleaners with HEPA filters, with those uh, carb labeling. And never allow smoking indoors. We didn't talk about that, but that's also one of the best things you can do to improve indoor air quality and lower risks. So radon test kits, hygrometers, dehumidifiers as needed, carbon monoxide alarms, air cleaners. These are all devices that are useful in improving indoor air quality or monitoring indoor air quality and radon. This is our team. 
Uh, FERDA is our boss, and uh, we have some specialists that deal with different issues like certification, indoor air quality, and radon, and we're doing a lot of outreach and education throughout the state. And if you have questions regarding this, this slide set, uh, you can let me know. Uh, you can email me directly or through this web page. Uh, there's a, at the bottom, there's an email, phtoxicology at flhealth.gov. That will be sent to me and I will respond to it. More information as well. Uh, I have posted a copy of this uh, slide set on um, on our Department of Health SharePoint for those of the, you that work for the health department. So you can access it there as well. All right, well, I, I thank you. Uh, I want to leave you. I started out with the radon poster contest, and I'm going to end with the radon poster contest. This is another entry that did not make it to first place, but it was my vote, and I just wanted to provide that to you. Uh, one that I really liked. I thought it was very interesting. So any questions out there other than uh, the technical problems? We do have two questions in the message bar, Tim. Okay. okay. So why are there no federal or state laws regarding mold? Uh, Part of it is because we have a lack of under, the scientific understanding about mold and health effects, and, and, and there's not there, since we have this lack of understanding, we don't have a way to develop a, a standard for what is acceptable or what is not acceptable. California attempted to do this; they actually passed a law and said, "Health department, you're going to set a standard," and, uh, and the health department says, "Okay, well, are you going to fund the research?" And the California legislature said, "No, we're not." And, and the California Department of Health says, well, I guess we are not going to come up with that standard because we can't do the research that we need to do to get to that standard. And so California has been struggling with this ever since. And what they've basically come up with is that mold growth indoors is unhealthy. It doesn't matter what kind it is. And they've actually changed their, their statewide housing code to include mold and dampness as a, a – uh, uh, a substandard housing condition which allows tenants to, to address this either with code enforcement officers or directly with their landlord and give them additional rights to take action. Uh, we do not have that in Florida because no statewide housing code has been authorized. Um, and so, and also no federal law regarding this has been authorized. Well, okay, with one exception, HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development has a, a regulatory uh, a rule that requires that uh, uh, housing that receives HUD funding must be free of hazards uh, to health and safety, and they actually list mold in that standard. Now, HUD has a problem with enforcing that, but that is their standard, and landlords are liable uh, for that if they receive HUD funding. So there, there are some regulations in different places, but here in Florida, no statewide regulations are authorized, and, and there are a few locations in Florida that have decided to include that in their housing codes, but there's over 450 city and county governments in Florida, and they're all allowed to do their own thing and make their own decisions on that matter. And that's something we are working on, is trying to increase the understanding of who does and who doesn't regulate mold uh, in the perspective of the codes. It's something that's we're struggling with. I think eventually, uh, hopefully, we'll have a website that will help people understand uh, where they can get that information. Uh, why did Florida Department of Health stop doing lead baits paint testing? Well, we haven't. Actually, we still have certified uh, lead-based paint risk assessors. They're certified through the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the, the legislature did not authorize a state uh, licensing program, so the EPA has to do it because it's a federal law. And uh, But uh, if you are working for a health department and you are investigating uh, elevated blood lead uh, poisoning uh, case in Florida, uh, if, you have, if you are certified to provide lead-based paint uh, risk assessment, then you're allowed to do that. 
And, and uh, so we have uh, a number of those in the county health departments. Not every county health department has one, but uh, I'm not sure. There's probably about a dozen of them. We do have a lead poisoning prevention program that is not part of our program. They're part of the Bureau of Epidemiology. They would have more information on, on who is uh, certified at the Department of Health for uh, lead-based paint uh, risk assessment for elevated blood level investigations. Hopefully that helps. Uh, were there any other questions? How can health department inspectors defend citing mold-like substances in migrant labor housing? Well, that is, uh, I'm not part of that program. I used to be a long time ago. Uh, that's our uh, facility programs. They're the ones who uh, uh, set the rules for the migrant labor housing camps. But uh, if anyone asks my opinion, whether it's a school, uh, assisted living facility, um, or a migrant labor camp, if if uh, if there's a requirement in the in the code for um, you know everything are, is to be kept clean and in a sanitary condition, then that's really all you need to cite. Um, you know whether it's mold or not, if it, it, it's it's not clean, right? Um, and that's the way I also. Uh, talk to code enforcement. I have gone to the Code Enforcement Association of Florida and have presented them uh, suggestions that they can, you know, address mold in their local code enforcement inspections uh, if they have, uh, you know, statements that the interior shall be kept clean and in a sanitary condition, that that, that is a reasonable uh, argument to make and reasonable citation. So that's my opinion. Now, it, what I would suggest you do if you're a health department and you're doing migrant labor camp, refer to your rules and talk to the specialists at the state health office in the in the facility programs, and they'll they'll guide you through that. Again, my opinion is just my opinion, but uh, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a regulator in, in the in the mold program. There's no mold program, so there's no regulation specifically on that. But you know, does that make sense? Hopefully. <laughs> If mold is in the bathroom of an in okay, maybe migrant labor camp, the violation files under falls under cleanliness violation 31. So that's from viewer 45. I assume that's someone who's more familiar with that regulation. Um, so violation 31, cleanliness. There you go. Thank you, viewer 45. Um, any particular questions about radon? Uh, we, we're 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 doing education like crazy for radon. We're we're giving out pamphlets. We're going to libraries. We're we're doing high school uh, science class uh, webinars. We're we're going to uh, homeowners education classes. We're uh, back in the past before COVID, we were doing uh, home shows and. We were doing presentations and training for uh, home builders, and we were going out to county and city councils and and to uh, builders associations and uh, building officials. And we will continue outreach to these uh, organizations and professionals and trying to uh, increase the amount of radon resistant new construction and increase testing. And we're also reaching out to real estate professionals. We have a video that we developed a, a while back that we just recently within the past week or two added to our website. And again, if you're on Facebook, there's a web, there's a Facebook campaign on radon right now where you can see our, our short 30 second video on radon. So how am I doing on time? Good, bad? Looks like- Good, yeah, we got 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so let me, uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, going back to that uh, slide set from the FIHA website, uh, take a look at that. It will give you more of a broader picture about um, air pollution in general, like outdoor air pollution. It will also go into safety and some issues like OSHA safety standards, and it also mentions uh, noise. There's a lot of information about noise as well. Whether or not it will be on the RS tests or not, uh, it's hard to say. From what I recall, the indoor 
the air quality and noise questions is about two questions about 100. So there may be more or less questions out there. I was talking to someone uh, earlier who took the RS test more recently, and they were, we were talking about rodents and rodent infestations and what are the health hazards associated with rodent infestations infestations and cleaning up rodent infestations, you know, the, the, the droppings, the nesting materials. And one thing we came up with was one health hazard is the potential for viruses, including hantavirus, which is a naturally occurring virus in the rodent population. And we found that in, uh, I think, the cotton rats uh, population in Florida. We've only had one case since 1993. Uh, thankfully, of uh, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome associated with rodent infestations. So that's nice. Unlike some Western states that have had dozens and dozens and hundreds of cases of hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, those are due to other species of rodents in those areas. Uh, but uh, still, in Florida, we should always be very careful and follow the CDC guidelines cleaning up uh, rodent infestations in buildings. Let's see, there's some more questions here. How can we tell if there is lead paint in old schools? Uh, can window blinds be used to protect the children from it? Window blinds. Um, well, if a school was built after 1978, they're not going to have lead-based paint in it. So that's one way of telling. Um, but basically, how do you tell if there's light lead paint in general, whether it's schools or homes? Uh, the techniques used for that, I used to be a certified a long time ago, uh, they involve uh, either paint chip testing, where you send it off to a lab, a, a paint chip sample. You may collect dust on the ground near walls or contact surfaces, and you can have that, that dust sample uh, analyzed for lead content. You can also uh, do um, what is called XRF, X-ray fluorescence. These are kind of radiation source materials. It's a device, an instrument. You you kind of shoot an X-ray at the, the surface you want to examine, and if there's lead there, it will excite, uh, it will send a signal back to the device, and it will tell you how much uh, lead is in the paint. So that's, uh, the XRFs are a very common tool for risk assessors when they're trying to determine if this lead-based paint is present. Uh, and there's also, you all, they're also doing samples around uh, soil because lead-based paint can be outside as well, and so they can test the soil to see if it's contaminated the soil next to a building, for example. But uh, schools, a lot of them have their own people that can to look into these issues. Um, uh, window blinds can be used to protect windows from it. I don't know. I'm not sure the answer to that question. Uh, in some cases, window blinds actually had lead in them. There was a number of uh, window blinds that they, they were made overseas that had lead in them and they had to be recalled. So sometimes the blinds themselves can be a source of, of lead, which is a problem. Uh, that happens. Lots of products over the years um, have uh, a lot of contamination in them, and even some toys have lead contamination in them. Uh, you know, for some reason, there's usually a recall every year of some product that uh, is found to have lead-based paint on it for children. Don't know why. Uh, I think people figured that out after a while. Um, so what will be on the test? Well, I'm going to suggest that uh, you take a look at the uh, RS study guide that the NEHA provides. Uh, or makes available. Uh, some of you may have copies of it. If you know friends that have taken the test, ask them if they have a copy of the of the uh, RS uh, study guide, and you can use that a lot for getting an idea of what type of questions you might be asked. So it gives you an idea of what you can study up on for the exam. And, and that that, uh, that study guide was available when I took the cast test in '96 or whatever it was. Uh, all right, XRS, yes, X-ray fluorescence, that's what that means. Uh, comment that's too damp in Florida for that. Not sure what that means, August. Um, many of the mini blinds will bleed lead-based particles. Yeah, some of them will, some of them won't, depends on whether they have lead in them. Uh, 
can you go back to the slide for construction of radon resistant home? Yes, I can. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm back. Oh, what happened? Oh, let's see. Swap. All right. Okay. Uh, okay, for new construction, was it? Uh, so this was uh, my introduction to that subject is um, – you know, it's actually cheaper to go with radon resistant new construction and build home than going in afterwards and trying to fix it. And there is a standard. It was developed by the Department of um, Community. They no longer exist anymore, but um, it was an old agency that, that had the building code. They developed a, a radon resistant um, standard, and it is now in Appendix uh, of the Florida Building Code for both commercial buildings and residential. And then the next slide was, okay, so this is a gas permeable layer underneath. This is uh, A, this is rock or a, a drainage mat, plastic sheeting on top of that and between the foundation and that uh, gas permeable layer. So the radon gets trapped in that gas permeable layer and the, you seal all penetrations around uh, the vent pipe or electrical or plumbing, and uh, you put that pipe in, plumb it out to the roof, and put in a junction box in the attic as a, as a place to put the fan if you need it later on. But this is uh, all of this is part of the standard except for the vent pipe and junction box. Those are recommended and part of an international standard. Um, but in Florida, we haven't got it in there, and hopefully maybe someday we'll change that. Does that hopefully answer your question on that? You're welcome. Um, okay. How can one distinguish between mold and effervescence, effervescence on concrete? Uh, that's great. That's a good question. Um, one way probably of doing it is looking at it under a microscope. Um, if you have a microscope, you can put uh, the material and, and examine it under high magnification. And, and if it's mold, it's going to be – it's going to look like mold. Um, an example um, – let's see. I think I have a picture. Pictures, pictures. Sorry, it's a little slow here. Um, uh, this is not fruitful. Also. So anyway, what I'm going to say is there's, there's pictures that you can uh, that you can you know uh, the the microbiologist can look at it and say yes it is uh, uh, or a, or a microscopist can look at it and say yes this is mold or no it's it's uh, something else and of course for concrete and effervescence that's also a chemistry test that they can do because it's it's actually uh, a salt. Uh, it's a salt that's traveling through the uh, masonry product. Uh, so that could be brick, that can be mortar, that can be um, concrete. Those are the materials that, uh, that this efflorescence comes from. Um, but yeah, it, it's 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 usually white. The, the efflorescence is usually white and granular, and it feels like salt basically. Any particular other questions?
anyone on the radon program on the call? All right, Tim. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate it. And we will have the, we'll have the presentation available uh, today. I'm going to edit the video now uh, and get that uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel. Uh, so for those of you that were in the meeting but did not have their name up on the participant list and it just says viewer on there or if you called in, uh, I'm going to leave the chat box open for a little while. If you can type your name in there so I can record your registration. Uh, you, or you can email info at fiha.org. That's info at feha.org. And just let me know that you uh, were in the presentation so that we can email you out your certificates. Uh, we will have our next presentation uh, on the 25th. Uh, you guys will all be getting emails about that. And we are going to switch meeting platforms for next time. We've had too many problems with this one uh, already. And we're going to switch to something else for the next meeting. So thank you all for attending. and. Uh, putting up with all the tech problems. Thank you again, Tim, for presenting and stay tuned for emails from us and for our next uh, series in the RS test review. Uh, we are going to aim to have two webinars every month. So if you are interested in presenting or if you have a good idea uh, for a topic that you would like to have uh, presented on, uh, again, email info at fiha.org or type it into the chat box. Uh, with that, thank you all for attending. Uh, I'm going to leave the meeting on for a little bit just so we can uh, get everybody in the chat box. Uh, but this will conclude the webinar.